I'm Tomohiro Ando at University of Melbourne. This event series is co-organized with Professor Robert Korn, University of New South Wales Business School, and Professor Valentin Zelenyuk, School of Economics, University of Queensland. Our mission is unleashing ideas and insights for harnessing the future of business and society. So today's main theme is experiments. If we hear a word, um, experiment, typically in business context, as we can see a uh, figure now, maybe typical example is research and development in pharmaceutical industry. But not only for pharmaceutical industries, experiments are everywhere, not only for business, but also for government, nonprofit organizations, and so on. In business, Amazon, they use experiments to improve their web design. Netflix, they are using experiments to improve their user experience. It can be used for product design, human resource training, improving supply chain management, improving productivity, and even it can be applied to startups. In startups, their business models are not fixed to improve or to get an idea from the, the value customer wants from the market. Startups, they can do experiments based on the outcome of experiments. Startup may pivot their business model if it seems to be that the outcome is reasonable. They may keep their current business model. In general, when we do experiments in our organization, usually we, we look, look back what is our mission and the goals? To achieve that goal, we have a strategy. And then to implement, we have KPIs. In general, experiments are used to improve our KPIs. But it's only applications of experiments. There are so many applications. And today, we are very happy and pleased to have Sean let me briefly introduce Sean. Sean, he finished his PhD. He got a PhD from New York University. And then he held research scientists and manager positions on core data science team at Facebook. Currently, Sean is at Radishia Labs at Lyft. His academic interest covers a wide range of topics, including forecasting, causal inference, random experiments, and more. Sean mostly specializes in methods for solving causal inference and business decision problems. So today, we are very pleased to have Sean. The talk title is An Expansive View of Experimentation. So before I hand over to Sean, I want to explain a bit housekeeping. So the structure of this seminar is now from now 40, 45 minutes presentation, and then the discussion and Q&A follows. If you have any questions, please use submit button, submit your questions by Q&A, Button, and then please upvote up other questions by using sum up. Now, we are very pleased to have Sean. And Sean, can you please start your talk? Yeah, thanks for the great introduction and, and for the opportunity to be here. Um, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to speaking. And um, thanks to the audience and looking forward to taking your questions at the end. Uh, let me get my screen shared here. Okay. Oh, 
I'll be able to write on the slides too. That'll be nice. Okay. So the talk title here is uh, an expansive view of experimentation. Um, this is the first time that I've given this talk. Actually, this this was written relatively recently. And uh, when someone here asked me to speak today, I really wanted this is something I really want to speak about because I think I'm I've, in the last couple of years working at Lyft, I started to think about these topics quite a bit. And, and so what I hope to relate to you today is sort of tales from behind the scenes at a tech company and how, how we're thinking about expanding the purview of experimentation beyond what more traditionally it's used for, which is kind of like more like policy evaluation. Um, and so I, I hope this sort of like, it's just a grab bag of ideas that I, I will tie a loose thread between, but I hope it stimulates some discussion and, and questions from you. And um, I'm open to kind of like, you know, being put, not, none of this is finished research or stuff that I expect to be right about. I think it actually like, you know, could be an interesting topic for debate and discussion. Um, all right. So, some mouse trouble. Current state of the world uh, for experimentation uh, is that what, what we call in, in, in tech A-B testing is a really ubiquitous tool. Um, and, and so this is like a, a wide range of tech companies, you know, uh, are, are using this to make decisions on a regular basis. Um, the scale of it is actually, you know, growing quite quickly. So uh, at Facebook and Lyft, two companies that I've, I've worked at, I, I know the scale is in the order of thousands of experiments are, are run per quarter. Um, and so, you know, this is just like an always on process in these businesses where we're constantly running tests in order to learn whether the changes that we're making to the products that we're that we run are, are favorable, you know, for our customers and, and for our businesses. Um, and so, so this like routinization of A-B testing is a, is a powerful tool and it, it sort of like, you know, provides a lot of value. And my question as a researcher is how do I use that tool to de deliver even more value? So how can we create even, even more and better decisions uh, by, by using experimentation? And so that's, that's kind of part of the goal of the talk is to think about well, what else can we do and how can it be made better? So just to you know, ground this in some, you know, some examples so that you have something in the back of your mind as I'm going through uh, you know, talk, talking about some, some work in the weeds things. Uh, this is this is roughly the two types of experiments that that we would be running at Lyft. Um, the, on the left hand side, we have like new products. So th this is the user interface for Lyft. When you're about to re request a ride, you know you would type in a destination and you know book, book a ride. But you know we have other products at Lyft, so, say like our our bike rentals um, or even public transit directions. And so we experiment with ideas like this all the time. So like, you know, if we add public transit directions to, to our app, that could be good. It could make customers happy. They have this new, new way to use the, the app that provides new value. It could also hurt our business metrics because maybe they start taking public transit all the time instead of taking Lyft. So, so these are interesting trade-offs that we make when we add new features like this. And this is an example of what I would call like a user visible product change. And then on the right-hand side, we have algorithms that power the decision-making within the app. So we have things like uh, I've highlighted here, the prices that we're choosing to charge for these different rides with different wait times are produced by algorithms. And those algorithms are things that we're constantly trying to tune and refine over time. Um, and so those are, I think, a little less user transparent types of changes, but they change the experience of using the app. So in this case, you'd experience sort of like a higher or lower price depending on you know, which version of the algorithm that we happen happens to run at that time. And, uh, and, and there's even more like less transparent, even less transparent versions of these changes. So like, how do we match a rider to a driver or how do we estimate how long it will take for a driver to get to a rider or all the kinds of things that like, you know, we wanna test in, in the marketplace and see how they affect people's experiences and marketplace efficiency and all kinds of things like that. Um, so in this talk, I'm going to sort of try to formalize a simple model of decision-focused experiments, right? Like the, the result of the experiment is that we change something about our business or our app or our algorithms. Um, so we're, we're, our goal is to make a change that's favorable, that moves us in a good direction, makes the company better in some way. Um, and the way that I'm going to talk about doing that is by building a model. So a model of our business and how what we do affects the outcomes of the business. Um, and, and, and this is kind of an important shift is that typically the way that people think about experiments in, in businesses is one shot decision making problems where they want to just sort of decide, is this thing good or bad? And if it's good, we keep it. If we think about model building, it's more building a theory or building like a kind of a, 
that a way of thinking about the business that accumulates knowledge over time and isn't just like makes decisions that we made in the past relevant for today in some way. So how do we learn more about how how our business operates through this through this through the, all the different mechanisms that we have under our control? And this can help us uh, to coordinate decisions across our company. And it can also help us to design more useful future experiments, ones that are more promising or you know are more likely to succeed. So a really simple view of A-B testing is like what I call like one-shot testing. So we're, the idea is that there's a team of people whose job it is to come up with an idea, like how we're gonna make a change in some way. So say the public transit directions is a, is a good example. So we're gonna go build a new experience for users and build a UI to present it to them. And that implementation is a long time, a long time and a lot of work. And there's a lot of data science effort that goes into that on its own. But then once it's completed, we still don't know whether we want to use it or not. So not all ideas are good. Some of them fail and aren't successful in product. And so the, the role of A-B testing in this world is completely separate from product building. So think of it as like, you know, these people live in a bubble where they implement ideas and then they hand it over to a team of people to decide whether it's good or not by running a test and then deciding at the end whether we should launch it or not. And so you could think of like this procedure as resulting in a single binary decision. So it's giving, you know, all the work that the experimentation is doing is resulting in like, you know, slightly better than guessing randomly between launching and not launching what we're, what we're doing. Um, and so this is like a very idiosyncratic process, right? It reveals like one bit of information and, and it's idiosyncratic to the idea that's being tested. So it's, it's not like a knowledge accumulator. It's just a sort of like, should I do this? Yes or no? Should I do this? Yes or no? Uh, but it but it has a nice architecture of that it separates the concerns between the teams. So one team gets to work on a product, one team gets to test it, and then um, and so they kind of like you know they're they're neatly pipelined in, in some way that, that separates things. And so a lot of the thesis of this talk is that these processes are sort of should be unified in some way. That like ideas come from uh, su successful tests and from unsuccessful tests in, in, in some way. So there are feedback loops that we can employ to implement even better ideas or move into run more promising tests. Um, so I, I promise that there, there's a little bit of math throughout the slides and I, I promise you don't need anything more than like an understanding of linear regression um, to, to make progress and understanding what, what I'm showing here, but you do need to understand that. And so I just kind of like, we'll walk through quickly, like a very simple model of like what we're, what we're doing when we're analyzing an experiment. So on, on the left-hand side, we have uh, a metric or you know, what some of here are called a, a KPI, uh, which is something that we care about as a business. It could be like profit, it could be rides in the case of Lyft, it could be uh, some kind of customer satisfaction or in the, you know, we have a driver side of our marketplace too. So it could be driver earnings. Um, and then D sub I here is a variable that represents like a change that we're, that we're gonna make or not. So D sub I could be zero or one. Um, it's one if we've made the change and zero otherwise. And so in the case where we've made the change and uh, we, we, we expect to get like alpha plus delta as our expected value for Y. And in the case where we haven't made the change, we expect to get just alpha. So del delta divided by alpha is our like, you know, how much value we created in, in percentage terms. Um, by, by you know, launching that experiment or how much we expect to get. Um, and then there's always noise. And so the noise of the, of the model is what's causing it to be uncertain. It's like, why, why can't we just try this one time and see that it worked? It's because each observation on its own is noisy. And so our way to alleviate noise is through higher sample size, this N, or through just having a less noisy data generating processes in some way. And so, so this is the workhorse model of experimentation is that we're we're going to keep building on top of this linear model by changing the changing the kind of inputs and changing the outputs and making it a little bit of a different estimation problem. So this is the mathy way of looking at it. We can also think about it as just like a flow of of information um, through through a, a little bit of a network. So we, as the designers of an experiment, choose the sample size and we choose how we're going to allocate the the treatment. So which users are going to get like you know, which version of the experience, like, are they going to get the new product or not? And then, and then in the next phase, we collect metrics about how, um, how those, how those users respond to that treatment. And then we have an estimation phase where we estimate Delta and decide whether Delta 
and then and then use delta in order as an input to a decision problem where we decide what to do based on that estimate of delta. So you can you know picture in a very simple world, why it could be profit. Delta, if it's positive, means that we've increased profit by setting d sub i to one. And so the, de the decision that we make is to like set d sub i to one forever after because it was it was a good change and made us more money. So how do we make an improvement in this very simple view of the world? Um, well, we only have a small number of mechanisms for doing so. One is to, is to deal with our sample size. So we can increase our sample size. We'll always make a better decision with more sample size. But we want to run more than one experiment. And so there might be some contention for the resource of sample size. And so allocating sample size between experiments is kind of a constant problem within a company. Um, and I'll talk a lot more about that later. We want to use designs that lower the bias and variance of our estimated effects. So the way that we randomize or choose who gets which treatment can affect whether we're able to estimate what we, what we care about. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit more about how we, how we do that uh, in later slides as well. Why sub i is like, how do we, what do we choose to even measure in the first place is kind of an important, an important decision. Did we, did we choose the right KPI? that actually captures and adequately represents our business goals. Um, so it's important to get that right as well. If we get that wrong, then we can optimize the wrong thing. Um, our estimation procedure in general. So can we do a better job of just estimating using the same data? And, and there are ways to do that. And I'll, I'll describe that in another slide. And then finally, like this like decision-making process at the end. So did we rationally translate these estimates into a decision that reflects our underlying business goals. And so um, in cases where we have more than one thing that we care about, this can become a little bit tricky. So let's use that segue to talk about that. Trade-offs are a super important part of running a business, especially a business like Lyft, where we have like multiple stakeholders. You know, we as Lyft like to make profit because we're, we're a for-profit company. We like to make our customers happy. So having the users, you know, do things that make them more happy is good. And then drivers have to earn money on our platform. So we have really like at least three stakeholders that are affected by any decision that we make. And so one simple modification to that model that I described is to add a new dimension to it, M, which is the metric dimension, which is like, you know, we have different effects on different metrics and those different effects might yield, lead to a different point in, in trade-off space. And so that means that now we have Delta is a vector of estimates. So there's one estimate per metric. And so in the simple case of two metrics, we can put it in two dimensional space here. So say that you know, we have this coordinate system. This upper right hand quadrant here is cha are changes that positively impacted both metric one and metric two. So you know, say one is like profit and one is growth, for instance. So both profit and growth went up. So therefore, this is a good experiment and we should definitely launch it. And then there are unambiguously bad tests, which like make both metrics worse. Um, the really challenging regime is like when it makes a positive impact on one metric, but not on the other one. And we have to kind of make some fine grained trade-offs. And so this is sort of like a key challenge within a company. Is how do we translate a result, which, which, which would be a point in this two dimensional space into a decision. Um, and often we don't even have a point. We have sort of more like a cloud of where it could lie, it could lie across this line or not. And so this is sort of like one of our fundamental problems and it's, it's revealed by like, you know, modifying that model that I described to you by just adding a new dimension to it. Um, second consideration for decision quality for us is noise. So un underlying noise in the data generating process is one of the largest problems that we face because we can only, we are capped at how many, how much sample size we can create. We have only some, some, so many number of events. So there's kind of like a finite amount of information generated by the operation of a tech company. And so our ability to extract more signal from the fixed sample size is really important. So there's this idea of like, how much better do we do per observation that we got? So we have like a budget of observations that's fixed. Then we really care about our per observation um, ability. And, and so the, the way to think about that is we call it precision. So this sigma square is, is the, is the variance of our error term, just like how much noise is there in the metrics on their own? Do they vary a lot wildly on their own? And if they do, then we're gonna to have to make really large changes in order to be able to detect them. Um, so one of the things that we can do as statisticians is improve the per observation 
decision quality by doing things like covariate adjustment. Well, this is where we add control variables that explain variation in the outcome and make the, make the epsilon sub i smaller in, in magnitude. Um, or we can transform the metrics. So sometimes there are large outliers, like you know people who uh, you know are very active and have you know thousands thousands of transactions. Or at, at Facebook, when I worked there, it was more common to have hyperactive users that generated like really large observations of why. And so one example of function that's a variable transformation that helps here is called Windsorizing, where we take large values and we chop them off and say like, you know, it matters, but we're gonna like limit how much influence it has over over the model, and that will lower the variance of epsilon sub y as well. So this is like this is a really common set of projects within an A/B testing shop is to make sure that you have you know lowered the variance as much as possible either through redefining your metrics or through controlling for things that explain variation in the outcome on their own. When you have other variables that you're collecting besides your KPIs, it also allows the possibility of what we call contextual effects, so you know, we, or heterogeneous treatment effects. So the effect of your treatment. The launch might differ depending on the conditions that you're facing in some way. So uh, this is a simple modification to the, the model I just described, which is to take the variable d sub i and interact it with x sub i. And then we have this parameter gamma, which gamma is representing sort of like the interaction effect between the treatment and this variable x sub i, which we know. So the way to think about this is like, you know, at the, at the time when we are deciding whether someone is getting the A or the B variant of the, of the test, we, we might have some other information available, like how active have they been, or you know, have they used a feature like this in the past? And that information could be valuable in explaining, both explaining the outcome on its own, but also explaining whether the treatment is likely to be effective or not. Um, and so this is a really powerful modification to the A-B testing methodology, because it goes from estimating like a single number to, in this case, uh, uh, three numbers, but really like, you know, you can think of this as actually a curve where the treatment effect itself which is denoted here, varies depending on the input variable x. And so there can be regimes where it has a positive effect and regimes where it has a negative effect. Um, and so this is a very useful technology in cases where we want to do targeting. So this could be, we only want to send you know, uh, coupons or incentives to drivers when it is effective, when it generates positive return for us. Or it could be that like maybe we want to launch a product only under certain market conditions. So maybe things work when we are in a supply constrained environment and X sub I could represent market balance, like whether we have a lot of drivers or, or a lot of riders. And so in those cases, we can, we can make choices depending on the environment that we face. So this, this all sort of like argues for like a distinction between a global policy and a contextual policy. And many A-B testing setups are sort of predicated on this idea of a global policy, which is that like whatever we launch, whatever we decide D star here, has to be launched to everybody. And there's no, there's no way we can kind of customize it depending on the situation that we face because we don't, we either don't want to maintain two separate implementations or you know, we, we just we don't have the ability to, to maintain two separate decision-making procedures here. Um, and this is a really common policy in practice because it means that we get to just move on to the next problem. Um, and we don't have to maintain a system, whereas contextual policy can generate like you know more more value per observation, but requires you know a more complicated setup because it means that in the future we're going to have to basically create a decision function that maps like what we know about somebody into what kind of treatment that they're getting. Um, so in practice at Lyft, we do both. I mean, and global policies are are used in cases where uh, you know we we plan to uh, launch something to everybody to all regions. Um, eventually, and so we're gonna just decide whether this has been a favorable change on average. Contextual policies are, are often used in cases where we have the ability to customize in, in some way. So another big modification of the model, besides adding exogenous covariates or the X sub i's, is just to add more D sub i's, so more ideas at the same time. So you know, if we go back to, uh, you know, this product change here, I have bike directions and public transit directions in here at the same time. So you can picture it's easy to generate other experiments where we had just the bike thing and just the public transit thing or neither. And so really, you know, the, the addition of these two features could be thought of as like, you know, two competing things or, two, you know, two things that are, uh, could be used at the same time. And, and we might want to try all, all four of those possibilities in something that's called a factorial design. 
And so if we're going to do that, then it makes sense to model them in a simultaneous model. So put them all into the same model and run the experiment at the same time. So it's easy to think of there's really about three possible cases when you have multiple things that you want to vary at the same time. Um, one is that they are not mutually exclusive and we expect the effects to not affect each other at all. So there's no interaction between the two. So this is a really common assumption in A-B testing is that we think of the test as not affecting each other at all. So the result from one test and the result from the other test uh, will be independent. And if we ran them at the same time, we would get the same results as if we ran them at different times. And what this allows us to do, if we believe this assumption, is to parallelize all our tests, run them all in parallel, ignore all the other ones that are running, and, and just let them sort of like all compete to find the best ideas independently. <laughs> And the nice thing about this is that it allows some parallelization. So if we have 100 ideas, we can test them all in parallel if we want. We can test them all sequentially if we want. We'll end up with the, with the same result. In case two, the ideas could be mutually exclusive. So maybe there's some space in the app that gets taken up by that particular change. Or we can't run two versions of our pricing algorithm. We can only really run one at a time. So, uh, so mutually exclusive ideas are just sort of ideas that like we have to only decide at the end that there's one of them. So it means that, that you know all these for all these different choices, we can only have one of them be on. And so this is this is the case of like we have k possible choices to make, and we're going to choose one of k. So it's a smaller search space. Um, and now the problem is that we can only really try one thing at a time. And so we have to allocate our sample size in an efficient way across all those possibilities because we can't run those tests in parallel. Only one of them can be on at the same time. And then finally, the, the hardest problem is when they are not mutually exclusive and they are not independent. When the, when, the, when the result of one test and the result of the other test can influence each other, the effects are not in, no longer independent. And now we have to do a coordinated search for a, a optimal, what I call an optimal configuration. And this is a large search base. So if we have k options, two to the k is a large number. So like you know, ten, two to the tenth is is like for a product test, like an astronomical number of choices. Um, and so we have to find a way to efficiently explore that. And, and that's that's one of the fundamental challenges of, of A/B testing in this kind of regime where you where things can things can be influencing one another in, in various ways. So just to go through like the simplest case, uh, the, ca the case where we have like, you know, here's a case, this is an example I pulled from my, my job at Facebook, but we had 58 options in this test. Uh, and you might wonder like, hey, how do you come up with like 58 ideas that are all equivalent? <laughs> and the answer is that like, you know, some things are, are essentially like very easy to generate new options for. So co colors or uh, <laughs> icons, um, in the case of Facebook, like I used to work on stickers within Messenger, so you know there's different sticker packs, and so we could we could randomize like which sticker pack was available to, to people when you know when they started using the app, and so it's very easy to generate many many possible options in, in those cases. Um, and so when you run many many experiments and you have to allocate your sample size fractionally between them, you end up with really wide error bars where you know any individual test on its own is, is extremely weak signal about whether it's a good idea or not. But the advantage is, is that you get to try a lot of things and maybe that is able to surface like really good ideas like these ones at the top. And, and so our ability to kind of sequentially cull the ones that are low performers and allocate more sample size to the ones that are high performers is what's called an adaptive design or other people call this a, a banded algorithm. Um, and so by doing so, we can kind of like rapidly move through rounds of a test to a point where we have converged on, you know, the best possible couple of options. Uh, and, and by the time we're at round four here, we have like, you know, surfaced the best possible variant. Um, and so this is, this is something that is like a real, a really nice extension of A-B testing because it helps us like try more things and explore a wider range of possibilities, but still use our sample size efficiently despite the constraints. Now, if, if those product changes or things that we're exploring interact in some way, we have a much harder problem as I described. And, and so that's evidenced by this, uh, this, this, these new terms in this equation here are interaction effects between all pairs of, of uh, experiments. And so di sub k, di sub l, so it's k times l. So it's basically like, you know, if k and l are on at the same time, then you not only get delta one and delta two, but you get delta one, two. And so, so this little diagram on the right here is what I call like a, an example of configuration space. 
So we have you know, option one and option two. And so we have four possibilities if they're each binary. And so we have four possible um, numbers that we need to estimate. We sort of assume that one of them is the control. So we now have to estimate three numbers. So delta one, delta two, and then gamma one, two, which is like what happens when, when experiment one and experiment two are on at the same time? Do they interact in some way? So this can lead to you know, two main types of mistakes. Um, if they interact negatively, it means that those two things combined are worse than adding the two of them together. Then it could, it could mean that we actually make a bad decision if those, two, if those two decisions are made independently. We make two decisions at the same time, but then together they actually cause each other to be worse. Um, and, and this is not that hard to think about cases where this can happen. You know, if their user interface changes, then one of them can make sense and the other one can make sense, but together they can make things not make sense for the user. Um, or more likely, it just sort of cannibalizes some of the effects. So it could be low just because it's sort of like they work through similar mechanisms. And so there's a diminishing return to so improving on both dimensions. Um, another side effect of this particular setup is that each of these two teams would have overestimated their impacts. So they're going to go and say, hey, I, I was able to produce delta two and I was able to produce delta one. But then when we add them all up, then the company isn't as good off, as, as well off as if we had you know, added these two things together. Another kind of perverse outcome can be that if this interaction effect is positive, um, we might not ever make it to this upper right quadrant because maybe this particular test here was negative and this one was positive, but we wouldn't ship both at the same time because the first one was negative, even though this position up here is, is better. And so, and so finding the optimal configuration in configuration space is actually quite challenging. It requires us to explore a, a wide range of, of potential configurations of, of, the, of the setup. And in this binary case, it ends up being like, you know, a two to the K number of options, which is, which is quite large to explore when you can't do it in parallel. Just as a quick like aside, I, I think it's really interesting to, to think about like, why would we expect changes that we make to interact with each other, either positively or negatively. Um, and, and so the decision variables that we have available to us, the idea is that like, you know, that each one doesn't affect the metrics through the through different unique mechanisms. They usually share some underlying route to improving some metric. So if we think of this metric as like rides and we want to increase rides at lift, then there are many ways to do that. One is to lower prices, one is to lower wait time. Um, so we really have these kind of like, you know, core mediators that are all, you know, being the reason why we're able to increase that metric. And so all these variables that we're changing, all the things that we're changing about the product and its algorithms are operating through some shared set of mechanisms. And so there's contention for improving that thing. And it can be difficult to, we can't improve price twice over. I mean, like two, two improvements to twice are, one might, might not be super additive or, you know, improving price and wait time separately might you know might not work as well as pr producing just uh, improving just one of them twice as much so there are lots of ways in which these things can interact and so that means that each of these decisions on its own can be needs to be coordinated with all the other ones um, in, in a world where there's like strong mediation of the effects through some bottlenecks of some kind this shows up a lot in some companies and, and not in others. So the two main companies I've worked for, Facebook and Lyft, Facebook actually could plausibly claim that most of the experiments would not interact with one another because the, the, the teams themselves were separated into, into relatively uh, you know, different parts of the experience. So Facebook, there's a newsfeed team and a groups team and an events team and a messenger team. And each one of those products is like a totally different surface, you know, like that, that part of the app looks different, it feels different, it has different goals, um, the people who are using it might even be slightly different populations, they're using it at different times. And so when you make an improvement in one of those things, it's unlikely that it's going to affect somebody's behavior in the, in the other part. Um, whereas at Lyft, really like we're stacking all of our algorithms on top of one another through like a really unified experience for, for people who are, are using, our, using our app. So all these things have to work in concert together to achieve a, a, a single purpose, which is like a, ride, a driver picking you up at the right place and the right time for a good price. And so like when we experiment with mapping that can change our routing algorithm, or if we change our routing algorithm, it can change our, how our ETAs are computed. If we change how our ETAs are computed, it will affect how we match uh, riders to drivers. And if we change how we match riders to drivers, we might want to change our pricing. <laughs> and if we change our pricing, we might 
that might affect how coupons are, you know, are, are effective or not. And so all these things kind of have to work together and sort of common goal. And, and that's quite a different setup than a company that just has a, like a, a, like a wide versus, I, I call this like wide versus narrow experimentation. So, so my main focus now working at Lyft has been like coordination between experiments. And, and so a, a key goal for coordination between experiments is like a joint modeling uh, multiple teams experiments at the same time. And the primary methodology for doing this is called a response surface. Um, so a response surface is a really powerful idea and it's, it's just a generalization of that same model that I've been describing before where now we have all the same decision variables that I described before. Are we gonna change D1, D2, D3 and, and so forth. But the thing that we've done is we made all those, those variables continuous. So now they can vary between in this case, between 0.1 and 0.25, and then in the second variable between one and four. And now with that, I can vary them continuously. Each one of these dots can represent a new experiment that I ran. And this is actually an example from real, real lift data here, where we're running, we have these two parameters that govern one of our algorithms, and each one of these points is an experiment result that we have. And now we have experiments that span this space, this two-dimensional space, we can fit a curve to that and use that curve to estimate the effect of any hypothetical parameter value that may, we might want to try. And, and so this is a kind of a marriage of machine learning and, um, and experimentation where we, we have a machine learning estimated surface that each point on that surface is an experimental estimate. So it's basically saying like the training data for this <laughs> machine learning algorithm is, is a set of experiments rather than a set of you know, uh, labels and examples. And what's powerful about this is that this methodology can become what I call like a knowledge accumulator. So each time we get a new dot in this space, our estimate of the shape of this curve gets better and better. We're able to pin down, you know, right now it looks like there's a peak over here in the top right and there's a peak down here in the, in the bottom left. And so if we wanted to optimize this metric, we could try to like run more experiments in the top right region and in the bottom right region and kind of like ignore this basin in between where like these are configurations that don't seem to uh, perform as well. And just to kind of like highlight that if I swap out that plot for the configuration space with the binary variables, it's really the same underlying setup except for, you know, it's the same idea, this, the axes of this plot are the same. It's just that because the variables are, are continuous, I can now use experiments that I used in the past to tell me about what's going to happen in new experiments. Whereas in, in this world, like each one of these four cases is a totally distinct object. In the case where we have a continuous surface, we can actually kind of move smoothly across it and, and kind of make some inference about what's likely to happen at new points in the configuration space. What's really powerful about uh, response surface methodology and, and, and the idea that we could run experiments like that vary things at the same time is that this provides a coordination mechanism between teams and allows us to say like, hey, the pricing and the dispatch team, which are two teams at Lyft that work on algorithms that power our service, can each independently try to improve their algorithms, but then our experimentation team can help try to marry the two into a better strategy than either one of them could have devised on their own. So here's an example of that same configuration space. Let's say the pricing team governs the x-axis and the dispatch team governs the y-axis. And so the pricing team could have found that their optimal parameter is along this, this vertical point here. Um, and the dispatch team could have found that their optimal parameter is along this horizontal line here. And so that would imply that if those two teams worked separately from one another, that they would have ended up at this intersection in the middle. But if we ran it together, we might find that the real optimal value is over here and that like the, the pricing team should have increased their parameter and the dispatch should have lowered their parameter and that we get a better value from being in this region of the space. And so this is a very powerful idea because it allows these teams to basically develop completely independently, but then we have this kind of clearinghouse where we, where we make the algorithms work together in the, in the last layer. And then finally, to, to do this process safely, we actually kind of need to create guardrails. So here's an example of like, we would want to, if this was a place where if pricing ran at a very high parameter value and dispatch ran at a very high parameter value, that this would yield like bad results for the marketplace in, in, in some way, we would want to detect that and like revert experiments that have that problem as quickly as possible. All right, so finally, like the, the response surface methodology 
it's very powerful in another way in that it tells us what it doesn't know. So we go back to this plot here, we know where we have samples and where we don't. And so where we don't have many points, it means that we don't really know. We don't know what's going to happen if we run the marketplace like that. So if we, if we shrink that down to a single dimension and just say like, hey, we just have control over X and we have run these five experiments so far yielding these five results, and that's this plot here. The, that Gaussian process model that we're using to fit the response surface can tell us that, hey, out in this regime, out past like parameter value of 10, we don't know what will happen and that the error bars are really wide there. It could, it could be really good. It could be really, really bad. And so this allows us to you know, prioritize experiments that help find better places for us to explore that are more efficient. Because if we explored like, hey, between these two points, we already have a good idea of like whether that's going to provide an improvement or not based on the model. So the, this adds a nice little feedback loop where we get a flow of information from we have design to implementation to estimation. And we still make our decision at the end about where we want to be, but our estimation can feed back into our design phase and say like, hey, we, we, we use the same model that we use to make the decision to help us design the next experiment and figure out like what, you know, what the best uh, place to look at would be when we want to run our next experiment. And so this feedback loop is very powerful because it helps us prioritize more efficient experiments that are more likely to yield better decisions. Okay, so one of the things I have completely ignored in all the setup that I've described so far is that at Lyft, um, things can affect each other. Each one of these rows in our data set is not independent from one another. Um, there are what we call spillovers. And spillovers are a really important source of uh, both benefits and costs to us. And, and so if we don't quantify that and include it in our model somehow, then we would, we would make mistakes. And it also affects the way that we design experiments. So as, as I'll discuss in a minute. So, I'm adding one simple term to this model, which is uh, we have the current effect of the launch. We'll go back to the binary, whether we're gonna launch the, very, you know, the thing or not and, and, and ignore the kind of response surface stuff for now. But we're adding this new term, which is the average of the neighboring observation. So let's say N sub I here is the nearby observation. So they could be nearby in time or nearby in space. And say this D sub I is a price change, say like a price increase. So what, what this would mean would be, delta would be how many fewer rides we would get directly from the price increase on the customer. But then this neighborhood around the observation would be other riders would also experience a high price and they would, they would free up drivers because they'd say, hey, I don't want to take a ride that would leave some extra drivers around. And so this delta or this gamma we would expect to be negative. It's sort of like help, it's helpful it's, it's hurtful in one way, I have to see a high price, but it's helpful in another way that the people around me see, also see a high price and it frees up drivers, which lowers my wait time. And so what we really care about when we're gonna launch this product to people is the effect, combined effect of, of delta plus gamma. And so we're gonna need to add them together. We need to estimate both. Um, and so this is an important consideration um, in how we design experiments is that we can't just randomize uh, these by, we need to randomize a whole neighborhood around people and for some definition of neighborhood. So the way that we do that is we use what's called a switchback design. So switchback designs are clustering the treatment in time. In, in time. And so uh, all the people who are using the marketplace at a certain time are getting the same value of the treatment. And so we cycle treatments on and off according to a, a curve like this, where, you know, like for some period of the day, it's the marketplace operates in one configuration, and then we switch it to a different configuration at a certain time. We have different designs for these kinds of experiments, but they typically involve some kind of randomization within, within some time blocks. So we might partition the time into two weeks, and then for any given time block, we might randomize across time, and then the second week we reverse it, and so we end up balancing out the noise that happens in the marketplace uh, week to week. And so this is a this is a way to do an efficient design. And, and, and kind of the important point here is that it's based on this spillover uh, phenomenon. So this spillover term here directly implies that this a design like this would be would be efficient and, and necessary for mitigating the bias of omitting that, uh, that that gamma estimate that I described. I know I'm running short on time, so I'm going to try to be a little bit faster in the next few slides. So I apologize that things will move quickly. <laughs> 
Another kind of spillover that can happen is what we call long-term effects. And so here I, I have the same spillover des description as before, but now I change the definition of this n variable, the neighborhood that's affecting me. And it's just, it, it's all the treatments that I as a user have been exposed to over the past. Um, and so if we, if we treat the neighborhood as like, what's the average experience that I've experienced? Have I been in the high price group for every one of my sessions for the last three months or only for the last month will, af will affect the value of the treatment. So we can think of delta as the short-term effect and gamma as the long-term effect. So one is capturing what will happen immediately to me if we roll this out and one will happen in the long run as more and more and more of my sessions qualify for whatever this new treatment is. So you could think of this as capturing things like habituation or learning about new product experiences. So that transit direction uh, uh, you know, example that I showed you, we might want to know like, hey, do people get used to this and they learn how to use it and they get more value out over time as, they, as they're able to do that. And that would be captured by this gamma term here, which would be capturing like, hey, repeated exposure to the same phenomenon is helping people get more benefit and, and learn more about it. Um, and then like, you know, in a really pathological case we can have, and this happens all the time at Lyft, by the way, we have both spillovers in the in the marketplace and also spillovers in time so we can have like two kinds of interference or spillovers long-term effects and the normal marketplace spillovers and then in these cases we have to run a very special kind of experiment which is called a we call a region split test where we put a whole region in the, and we switch on an algorithm or switch on a new thing for that all the people in that region and keep a set of control regions where there's people that um, are never going to get that launch until we verify that it worked well and in these cases, we do what's called a synthetic control estimation strategy. So sorry, the design stuff was very fast and I'm happy to chat more about that in the questions, but I'm just gonna wrap up the talk now. So what's the theme of all the things that I'm describing to you? I, I use the same simple linear model, but I kept adding more and more stuff to it and came up with a very general model. Um, and it's just a sequence of expansions of a very simple setup into you know, more and more and more complexity. Um, and, and so the, those expansions, as I described, are the metric space expansion. So considering like more measurements and more variables as outcomes is one kind of expansion. Context space expansion. So we know more about each observation in advance and we're able to leverage that information to both reduce variation and also, also to model heterogeneous effects. We have an action space or decision space expansion. So we're able to consider more possible variables that we can control, like our, 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 set, our, our, our set of available controls that affect how the company operates can be pooled into, get into the same model. And, and we can learn how they interact with one another. Um, we can complicate the spillover structure and think about how things that we did in the past or at different times and to different users accumulate effects or cause things to happen that are beyond their immediate uh, context. And then finally, we can use all the information that we created through these models to do more adaptive design. So inform the set of actions that we explore or the sample size that we allocate to them. And, and, and that allows us to be more efficient and to learn, learn faster and use our sample size in a, in a more parsimonious way. So to, to sum up, all of this, what does this do? What is the future of experimentation when you think about it this way? Is that it's no longer a decision-making tool that reveals a single bit of information at the end of every experiment. It's this type of navigation. Um, and I, I like to push on this analogy a little bit. Like you're, our companies are like ships and they're sailing a sea of high dimensional possibilities. It's not just North and South and East and West that you can go. There are many, many dimensions to these decision problems. Each one of those product changes is a step in a different direction in a high dimensional space of options that you, that you have. And so we kind of explore that space in a little bit of a random walk. And that's what I'm calling the action space here with a goal toward improving on some dimensions and metric space. And so really our goal as experimentalists is to, is to navigate this map and find our way on this map in a better direction, either up into the right or <laughs> like up or to the right are both good here. And you can think about like, you know, I have two green arrows here representing like two different kinds of business priorities or goals. Like there, there's worlds where you care a lot more about the Y axis than the X axis and you try to navigate in that cardinal direction. And there's worlds where you care more about the X axis than the Y axis and you navigate in that cardinal direction. 
But our, our tools for navigating in metric space all live in action space. We have to change something in order to make a move in metric space and to earn more profit or to have more loyal customers or to have drivers earn more money. And so this is the this is the key map. We need to we need to learn this map and we need to learn it as efficiently as possible. And we need to kind of navigate along that map and find our way to you know the, the best possible configurations. And so that that's the, the future of experimentation is that it actually is driving business strategy at a very high level by helping us find the find where we need to head. All right, I think I'm gonna stop there, but thanks for everybody for your time. I appreciate you listening to a, to a new talk and one that says unpolished is this one. Thank you very much, Sean. Your talk is very insightful. And uh, thank you for sharing your know-how, how do we analyze data. Um, it's very well summarized. Um, yeah, there's so many items I got impression from your talk. Yeah, so many uncertainties. We have to manage stakeholders and coordination. There are so many items. Um, before I throw questions from audience, let me start one simple question. Yeah. So, what kind of what kind of points are essential if we if we um if I'm running a company if you want to apply your ideas to my own company, what yeah. kind of points are essential to? Yeah create a value within my organization. Any thoughts? Yeah, I think it's a good question. Like, what do you need to enable these kinds of strategies? And the, the key ones are really like centralized tracking of, of your experiments. So until you can centralize that, and if everybody's running experiments, but they don't talk to one another, or there's no common record of what was what was done and by whom and at what time, then it's very difficult to synthesize any new information. So the centralization, and we, we call that uh, an exposure log. It's like a log of like every decision that we could have made and what we chose to do. Um, and then the metrics unification is, is really important too. So until you're unified on like a set of metrics that you care about and you believe that they're aligned with your business goals, it can be very, very difficult to make unified decisions that are you know pointing, pointing in, in the right direction. And then finally, like, you know, the analysis part of this, I didn't talk really much about at all, but, you know, having a kind of routine analysis procedure that can produce reliable results from the input data is, is crucial because you can't have people, two people analyze the same data and end up with different answers, then that's another source of variation in your process. Um, and, and so a lot of this is about process standardization in, in the same way that running a factory more efficiently means like eliminating other sources of error <laughs> In your process, it's the same thing with decision making. Is that there are sources of error in your process, and you, you need to eliminate those, and, and and they come from wildly different places than in a factory line, but they still matter just as much. I agree. I agree. Thank you very much. Yeah, because quite often some organization they have a lot of silos, and within silo they play, but in the end, as an overall, they have to unify themselves. Quite often, it's critical to be successful. So there are now two questions from the audience. Can you read and answer, please? So you can you please um there's a two yeah. question and answer bar. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I got them. So the the first one seems to be uh, when your estimation step is a model instead of a simple group mean difference. How do you do the sample size calculation and select where to experiment? which of the covariates chi gamma xi gamma to experiment on? Uh, great question. Um, so when you have a lot of experimental design and power calculations and things like that are, are designed for a very simple setup where you have a, uh, you know, you're able to compute a difference in means and then decide whether to reject the null about one being greater than the other. And so yeah, like I am advocating for a, a more model-based approach. And I think it does mean that uh, deciding on sample size is, is more challenging. Um, it's, it's not that difficult to uh, make assumptions and run simulation exercises. So if you, if you ever want to generalize power calculations, you can simulate new data um, from your old data, but just add effects to it. And then just like decide, use that simulation and vary the sample size to decide like where would you hit like a decision criteria, decision quality criteria that, that you want. Um, 
And the same thing, if there are covariates available, you can add those to that model. Um, but I think simulation is the most powerful approach for planning these kinds of things is that you really have to kind of like assume you knew the treatment effect in advance. And then now you know what your decision should be and then decide like, okay, well, how do I vary the design of this experiment? Or the uh, or the sample size to get to the decision that I know is the correct one, and how likely it might be wrong depending on those design parameters. And so I, I I think I could talk a lot more about simulation, but that's that's really the rough answer is just sim simulate as much as possible, get good at simulation. <laughs> All right. Uh, the second question is: These machine learning combined with experiments seem exciting methods for producers, but also seem scary for customers, don't they? Indeed, they seem to be capable of extracting all the consumer surplus from each customer, especially the more vulnerable elderly children who don't have enough knowledge and experience transferring them to the producer using such methods. What do you think? I mean, I, I do think that like, you know, we're, I, I have been calling the process that we're going through ca causal engineering. We are engineering systems that create effects that we want. Uh, and so there's a, there's a number of ways to try to, to make that safer. Um, one is that the, the metrics themselves have to capture some notion of customer value. If, if we just optimize for profit at all times, then yeah, of course, I mean, that, that would probably be very extractive. And, and we don't do that because we know that that creates like bad long-term cu customer value. And, and so like, you know, ch the choice of metrics and what you're actually optimizing for, if you're pushing some optimization machinery at a problem, of course, it's gonna, you know, it's gonna do, you have these be careful what you wish for problems <laughs> where you get what you wanted and then you realize later that what you wanted wasn't really good for the world or, or for your customers or, or for other stakeholders uh, like the environment or, or for you know, people in underprivileged populations that are, you know, that, that are not really adequately accounted for. So if you, have, if you have things that you're worried about like risks of harm to subpopulations, then you need to have metrics for those things and, and, and track them and be able to kind of measure the deleterious effects. And so it's, it's kind of like our responsibility to measure all consequences, not just the ones that we want to happen, but the ones that we're worried about happening. Um, and, and so that's kind of like one, one tactic is to just you know, try to perform the measurement and be adversarial about whether these things are actually good or not. I think that like, you know, for a lot of businesses and you know, for Lyft, I think, uh, we, we can't just like do bad things because we have strong competition. So, so economic competition is a driving force for consumer surplus. So we, you know, if we uh, raise prices too much, then Uber will just take all those customers. And so we, you know, in competitive markets, I think the dynamics are in the customer's favor in a lot of ways and, you know, customers really benefit from the experimentation that we do, because really our, our job is to actually create like efficiency and and total pie size. And then how we split it basically boils down to competition stuff, which, which we don't really, we can't experiment our way to a less competitive environment. Uh, and, and so I think in, in some ways we're relying on market forces to, to help you know, balance things out for customers. I do think that plays out in practice, but I guess that would be pretty company specific. Um, you might make the opposite argument about, you know, I used to work at Facebook. Facebook has huge network effects that are very difficult to overcome. And so, and so customers might be like trapped with a product they don't like, and, and that, that's a reasonable explanation for, for where they've ended up with their product. Um, and so it, it doesn't always play out in the customer's favor. Um, so, you know, maybe one approach to helping improve consumer welfare here would be for companies to be more transparent about the metrics that they're optimizing for and, and, and you know, greater disclosures about, you know, the other metrics that they track and what the effects of their, you know, the changes that they've made on these other metrics are. Or even letting like a, you know, a government group submit metrics for evaluation say like, hey, like we have this like equity metric or, um, you know, for, for us as Lyft, like one of the things we worry about is um, access to Lyft and maybe some of the changes we made may make Lyft harder for people to get, in, you know, poorer neighborhoods or something like that. And so if we can, if we can track a metric related to that and see how the changes that we made have affected it, then, then we can answer questions and help us like revert things that are harmful. All right. Third question here is, uh, can you suggest some variance reduction and noise reduction techniques using pre-experiment pre data for binary variables? Uh, yeah, great question. Um, you know, variance reduction is like a, there's a bajillion things to try there. And, uh, and there's lots of great exciting stuff coming out right now. Um, I would say the, the baseline method for, it doesn't even, 
it doesn't matter what type of variables that you have. Uh, usually, um, so binary variables are, you know, we still use a kind of normal approximation. You could use like a logistic regression model with binary variables, but you're still using the same approach, which is that you want to have some uh, covariate adjustment process or control variables, another name for them. And, and so what, what those are serving to do is explain more of the variation that is not uncontrolled by you and leave less of the less less fewer alternative explanations related to things that are you know not under your control. Uh, the uh, you know there are regression based techniques for that. There's also machine learning based techniques for that. There's a, a new paper out of Facebook that I, with some people I used to work with called ML rate, which is like a generalization of uh, double ML estimation for uh, experiments. And so that, that's a way to apply, like you could apply like black box machine learning models, you could apply neural networks, decision trees, whatever you want, and use it to residualize and then use the residuals in the, in the downstream model. And so there, there's just a wide variety of options. Um, with binary variables, you won't be able to do some metric transformation or anything like that. So it really basically boils down to like, are you able to um, explain a lot of variation and build, build good predictive models that don't include your um, the variable from your experiment? All right. Next one, uh, Marianne Williams. I love the navigation analogy. I imagine you have some kind of representation of the map you're creating, even if it is crude at this stage. A natural question for these in AI and robotics is how have you used or thought about using ML to build, learn, and exploit the map? <laughs> and these are, this is a really great question. I think the map analogy is relatively recent for me to think about. I, I think, um, you know, the, the leap from a lot of individual decisions uh, that all individually are good to a more cohesive view of your metric landscape is, is still one that I'm kind of like only now recently making intellectually. So what does the map really look like? Um, I, I do think that, you know, our ability to, to steer the ship and what, what we have control over is relatively limited, right? Like, you know, for a product like Lyft, it's, it's really limited by physics and we have a certain set of options and we have, we have prices and we have ETAs. And so there's just like a really low dimensional space of things that we can even do. Um, but we have some new directions in the map. So uh, one of them is memberships. So we're, we're working on like a memberships product. And so you can picture like memberships as like an unexplored, territory on the map and we don't we don't really know what will happen when we, when we move in that dimension and what it will do to all of our other previously optimal decisions um, and it, it's also worth noting that the map can affect, can be changed by reasons that we don't really uh, control so like we our competitor could release a new product or lower prices or something like that so that would that would change our map, map as well I will say I have spent more time thinking about the metric space than about the map space and the metric space itself uh, is like if you take all of your old historical experiments, you can look at the correlation between treatment effects on different variables. And what you often find is that there's a low dimensional structure to it. So if you have like a hundred different variables and you have effects on all 100 of them, often they move in correlated ways. So like when we, when we increase wait time, we know that we're gonna get fewer rides on usually, and that those two things will always move in opposite directions. Um, and so there's kind of like a low dimensional manifold of possible changes that you can make uh, and that like, or effects that you can create. And I, I think that that's like a fun thing to look at and it kind of describes like fundamentally what kind of surface are you, are you playing on? But ultimately like good, you know, good product people and good companies should be good at breaking out of that possibility. We have this kind of production possibility frontier that's available to us by you know moving around in action space, but you know a good a good company should be good at like building new parts to the map that don't exist yet and like helping you access like you know part parts beyond your existing set of trade offs. So a um, little bit of a meandering answer, but I, I think it's interesting. I think visualizations would be would be fun to create, and I, I think like ultimately like company strategy you know should be we should think of it as a map and we should try to think about it more as like you know exploration process and and I think that would be a healthy attitude about projects instead of like feeling really near and dear to like if you're an explorer you're not like you have some hope that where you go and where you headed your ship is like likely to succeed but I think people are realistic about like oh you know going back to the safe place is probably where we'll end up anyway or um, and, you know, maybe that's a good, a good way to think about running a business is like it's exploration and you only really stay in the new place, new place if it's really better than the old one. All right. 
Some researchers use Bayesian estimation to carry out experiments. What do you think are the disadvantages and advantages of experiments using Bayesian estimation? Yeah, this is a, another good question. Um, I'm glad, by the way, these questions are great so far and I'm really, I'm excited that so much of the material of the talk was, was relatable. Um, so, you know, when I described that, uh, that setup of the experiment, I, I didn't talk about priors or anything like that, but I do think that like Bayesian estimation and adding more structure to the model are very like compatible ideas. So thinking about like, oh, what is my model and what assumptions am I willing to make about my data generating process and how would they affect uh, uh, the conclusions that I draw? Bayesians are really good at that and have a good set of tool tools for implying, imposing knowledge that they have on the problem and getting you know better estimates out of them. So some some tools like that that we have used in the past are like sign constraints or monotonicity constraints or shape constraints on particular parameters. So we like know roughly when we raise prices that people aren't going to take more rides. So that you know there's ways to add informative priors on parameters and get lower variance estimates. I think. There's a whole class of estimators called shrinkage estimators, uh, particularly for experiments where you're taking all of your experiment estimates and shrinking them a little bit towards zero, which is, can be thought of as a, having a normal or Laplace prior on the treatment effects. And uh, you can motivate that either through frequentist uh, methods or through just having like kind of a prior that most experiments don't really do anything, which is, which is roughly true. And you can achieve that through a meta-analysis of many experiments. And so, you know, Bayesian models are really good at partial pooling of results. So using sort of like many experiments in one model usually improves the efficiency of the, of the global model. And so a lot of these ideas are like, you know, super, super compatible. I think the actual fitting procedure, I don't care that much about that. Like whether you're gonna use like MCMC or whatever particular Bayesian estimation technique. Like I, I think, you know, all that stuff should be correct, but I don't, I don't have a strong opinion about, you can get like Bayesian like results with frequentist methods. You can get frequentist like results with Bayesian methods. I, I think ultimately it boils down to like, are you willing to make assumptions or not? And are your assumptions buying you anything or are they biasing your results? Okay. In adaptive testing, how do you fix the sample size allocated to the algorithms for the next round at each iteration starting from 58 algorithms? Okay, great question. Um, this is, this is, there's a wide range of algorithms for, uh, for deciding on sample size and the sequential testing regimes. Um, I probably, the, the most common one is uh, Thompson sampling. So in Thompson sampling, we have all those estimates, right? We can sample from the posterior for each one of those estimates and then take the one that is the maximum uh, of, of those and then and then you know do that approach many many times and it will give us a distribution of samples across those 58 so a really low estimate that has like no upper bound you know very little mass in the positive regime would have a very low probability of getting a new arm assigned to it because it would have very low probability of having the maximum estimate for a random draw um, so Thompson sampling is a, is attractive and like you know there's lots of great um, implementations of that and it's easy to easy to implement yourself. Um, and there's, there's other banded algorithms as well, like UCB is another one. So, you, you know, you rank them by the upper confidence bound. They all roughly correspond to some trade-off of like equal allocation of arms across, across treatments is wasteful because it's like including arms that are not particularly high performing, but allocating like all of your sample to your best arm is also like, you know, under exploring and not acknowledging that some of the estimates might change if you have more, if you have more, um, if you have more sample size to allocate to them. So I, I would say like, you know, you, you have a menu of options to choose, choose from there. How, how well they work in practice is a subject of intense academic debate. And I think practically speaking, they all kind of do the same thing. And you know, the savings that you get from doing something fancier don't tend to be that great. So any, anything adaptive in general just is like far better than doing something not adaptive. So, so if, you're, if, you're, if you're doing that, you're already way ahead of the game. So, if you have any questions, please post Q&A uh, uh, button. Um, then I want to, if you have a time, um, so I want to continue a uh, conversation with Sean. Oh, <laughs> sorry, you talk a lot. <laughs> um, so let me change a bit, a focus a bit from manager side. So you have experience as a manager. Yeah. According to your experience, what kind of challenges 
do, did you have, as a manager of data scientists, data scientists, they have a lot of, yeah, in general, what kind of challenges did you have and how did you overcome? Can you share with some examples if you might have? Yeah, I mean, uh, well, I could do a whole talk on <laughs> how, hard, how hard it is to, I mean, I think a lot of the challenges of managing data scientists are similar to the challenges of just being, you know, being a data scientist in a big company. Uh, probably the primary one being like, how do you decide what to work on? Because there's usually a wide variety of, uh, of, of hypotheses about how to Im improve the product. And there's a, there's a bit of an explore exploit trade-off to be done there, like, you know, pick, picking projects that could, you know, maybe more reliably make things better or that are more speculative. Um, and so as a manager, I think a lot of my job is like, you know, finding and sourcing the right project that fits people's um, risk tolerance for those kinds of things, plus their expertise, plus what they want to learn. Um, and, and also is aligned with the company goals. And also is, you know, there's a timing thing for projects. Like sometimes the organization just isn't ready for them. So in a lot of ways, I think of like, there's this portfolio optimization procedure that's kind of going on at all times, which is like, you know, you have this set of constraints, which is like people can only work so many hours per week. And, the, and you have all these other constraints that you're layering on, like this person is good at this, but maybe a little slower at this, or that, you know, this, this person really wants to learn about this, or this project really needs somebody. And so there's a lot of stakeholders to be balanced. I, I wish I could do some kind of Bayesian optimization procedure for, <laughs> For this, but you've got, you have to make you have to make more binding commitments to these things, and you can't switching between projects between people is uh, is costly as well. Um, plus, there's like end of the year, you know, performance evaluation timing, which means like, oh, I would love it if I reveal a lot of information about that this project was valuable in time for that person's promotion case. Or that. Um, so, I think I take a little bit of a, a greedy strategy there, which is when when there are good opportunities or good fits for people, I, I try to push them really hard to be decisive about that and make and make sure that they they like you know stick stick to the projects. And then I, I think another big part that's a good a good management tool is just more communication about the process and the findings along the way. Um, one of the one of the big pillars that I have as a manager is called like bringing people along for the ride. Of the, of the research, you know, you don't want to just show up with the result at the end of six months and say, here's what I, here's what I learned, or here's what we should do. I, I think if people are involved in the process of creating research and learning about what you learned along the way and what you tried and that didn't work, they can learn from that. And it also builds, builds trust with them. And so I think that that's, that's often a thing that is not top of mind for a lot of scientists. Scientists really like to do the science, but sometimes so, I guess some of them like to present it, some of them like to do it, some people like to do both, but you really have to you know, do both and over communicate to be effective in an organization. Um, and, then, and then I guess like a third thing would be teamwork and, and co coordination within a team. Um, you can't just do data science work by itself within a company like Lyft and get anything done. You have to work with product teams, you have to work with uh, you know, engineers, designers, um, and, and, you know, be effective in this kind of, we call it cross-functional work. And uh, that's a, that's a whole other set of skills that people need to be trained on and get feedback on. So it's a lot of small, I think management in general is a lot of small course corrections and just trying to kind of nudge things in a better direction with very sparse and periodic feedback that is not very reliable. So it's, it's a tough job, but it's fun. And probably the best part is seeing people make progress on hard problems that I don't think I could make progress on myself. It's, it's really fun when like, you know, somebody goes, goes away for a couple of weeks and they come back and they have an answer to a question that we didn't think we could answer. That sounds great. So I just wondered, yes, thank you for sharing your thoughts on as a manager of data scientists. That uh, sounds great and reasonable. And uh, if you, uh, so what kind of support do you, if you are a role of manager or director, what kind of support from executives are helpful in kind of managing yeah. data scientists or leading the organization or one unit? Um, any thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, the le leadership's role in um, in supporting a science organization is really important. Um, I, I think like it's it can be quite variable, like how interested leadership is and how important that they view scientific contributions are uh, to the progress of the company. Um, I think 
I think a lot of it boils down to like whether you, what do you look at as the, uh, as the way that we build value for the customer. And some, some companies are, I think, very product focused. They think that building good products is the way that you make a good company. You know, Apple might be a good example of that. So Apple like famously doesn't use a ton of data because they just think, hey, our, de our designers and our product people are going to build like really good products. And so like, the you know, we'll know that the it was successful because we sold a lot of units. And, um, and so if, if leadership believes that science has only a very small role in improving the business, then that's the kind of buy-in and support that you're going to get from them. Lyft is a company where I believe like a lot of the, a lot of the power of the platform is the algorithms themselves that power it. So if we can, if we can move around configuration space, we can generate surplus for everybody. We can generate like free, you know, free extra wait time, like lower wait time for people. And it, it can be like, you know, costless to us if we're just more clever about how to use the data. And I think leadership at Lyft does believe that, you know, the, the role of science is really pivotal to the success of the, of the product and that the product itself matters, but also making good decisions and all the little micro decisions that we make at scale add up to a lot of value. Um, and so when they believe that, they actually give you resources to act on those ideas. So when we pitch wildly ambitious ideas that require a lot of people and a lot of time <laughs> before we get feedback, you get you know, the buy-in and resources to, to do stuff like that. And that, that helps us um, be a more on the explorer than, more on the explorer than exploit side of things, which generates, you know, more um, high variance, like bright tail kind of outcomes where we can generate big wins. Yeah, thank you for sharing your thought. So let's assume if you might have, a, you have a huge support from executives, um, you have huge budget and everything. <laughs> All right, so let's assume that. <laughs> Um, of course, time, resource, everything is limited. Uh, yeah. So one question, because uh, from my perspective, good thing of analytics, artificial intelligence, machine learning, is we can improve our, our efficiency. Yeah. Um, even, even experiments, we improve KPI through experiments, business experiments. And to scale up the benefits from these experiments or analytics activities. I think the automation seems to be a key component for large organization. Can you share your thoughts around this area? Yeah, I mean, automation in, in general, I mean, it's a really big part of what we need to do because uh, we, you know, Lyft, Lyft is a, is a uh, not, it's like a, I would call it like a, it's a, it's a, it's a low margin business. You know, you, you know, we're making relatively small amount of money per, per transaction. Um, and, uh, and the, the cost is a big component. And so like the lowering costs and being more efficient with, with your resources is important. Automation is the clear path to do that. I mean, it, we also have this sort of like self-driving automating the actual labor involved would be like the long-term you know, way to make the cost go down. But but for now it's like, you know, each decision that we make, if we make it slightly better, then we can make, you know, uh, you know, extra penny here and there. And those, you know, because we make millions of those decisions that adds up to a lot of money. And that makes it so that we can present lower prices to riders or we can we can offer to pay drivers more if we're able to control costs. Uh, and so like automation is the key to unlocking these high volume decision benefits is if you're making like, you know, millions or billions of decisions per day, you can't manual, you can't scale manual improvements. Like I, there's no way to make a manual improvement roll out to that many decisions. And so the automation is just kind of like the, the, the crucial piece to it because, because not only does it allow us to like scale out improvements, but it also allows us to like steer that ship in a more automated way. So. So we do have some manual processes that lift that like, you know, we, we try to push more toward automation because they become more responsive and they become more amenable to experimentation when they become automated. So one of them is like, you know, every week we have to decide what our plan for the week is, our weekly plan. And that's a very manual intensive process right now. We have humans in the loop for many of the steps of that plan creation. Because there's so many humans in the loop, it's very difficult for us to run like an A-B test on our planning process. Like, what if we plan this way? What would happen? Would it be more efficient? If it's not automated, we, that experiment would have to be run through like telling people to behave differently, which they may, may or may not do. But if it's automated, we can run a test and, and, and discover the answer to that question. So automation is not only like an efficiency gain on its own, but it like it unlocks the ability to like iterate and change things at a, at a more faster, more fast cadence. Um, and finally, like the you know uh, adaptability of the system, it really hinges on automation. So when the pandemic started two years ago. 
uh, there was a big change in consumer and rider behavior and our, our systems were designed under a certain environment. How do we change them? Well, a lot of manual changes were needed to, to fix things and to make them work in that environment. But like if, if things had been even more automated, we could have maybe turned some knobs and levers and like experimented our way very quickly to a better configuration. Um, and, and so like, you know, being able to kind of heal a system when it's not functioning properly is, is another really like, you know, I think of the, the, the pinnacle of automation in my mind is the, um, the thermostat. It's like a nice, it's a simple technology that you never have to question and it always sort of adapts to the situation that's at hand and does the best that it can. And, you know, there's not a lot of pathologies to its performance. Um, and, and so if we build more thermostats, then there's more things that we just get to take for granted. And then it lets us focus on, you know, applying our human effort and brain power to problems that are like not automatable. Thank you very much, Ian. So because my, my thinking is still, although automation is a kind of buzzword these days, but still there's an area, the art, human management, people are gonna play. It cannot be replaced. And uh, I totally agree with you, uh, what you said. And uh, yeah, so you mentioned pandemic. <laughs> so how uncertainty, I mean, people, you mentioned, Sean, you mentioned people, be, people's behavior change because of the pandemic. How this huge shock influence what you shared today? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it would be hard to, it would be hard to say it wasn't influential. It, it was, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, is is really great about working at a company is uh, you, normally experiments are like a, like I said like a one shot experiment. We have a lot of always on experiments at Lyft where you know they're just on all the time and we can constantly explore uh, some parameter ranges. And seeing the estimates from those models change in response to the shifting demographics and behaviors and you know attitudes and outside options of the people in the marketplace was a really powerful experience for me to see things basically like change really rapidly like that and that for the causal effects to change um which which means you really need like adaptable systems they need to be like able to to change in the face of new information and, and that 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 to me is the hallmark of a, of a good experimentation setup is that like experimentation uh, is most powerful when you are you're you're very Bayesian about it where you update your beliefs as you have new evidence and every single you know every single day that goes by we get more and better evidence about what's going on um, so I think of experiments as kind of like you know the perceptual system of the company in, in some ways. And when things change, your perceptual system becomes even more valuable because it means that like what the input signal that you're getting is, is varying and it means that you can change your behavior to, to get like a better result. So yeah, super, super influential for me. It was really interesting to see how many things broke during the pandemic, like assumptions that were unchecked that broke. And so there, there were things that continued to work and things that didn't work. And I, I would say like, if I had to kind of characterize them, things that continued to work were adaptive and responsive to data and things that didn't work were things that had a lot of assumptions <laughs> baked into them. So more you can rely on data than priors um, and let, you know, gracefully switch between those two things, I think the, the happier you're gonna be. <laughs> Thank you. So I, we, we want to continue this seminar, but we only have five minutes left. So, <laughs> There seems to be no question from no more questions from the audience. Uh, so there were there were there were actually oh. three new ones added. Oh, um, oh Adi, I'll oh, try you. I'm, ha I'm happy. I'm happy to. Yeah, try please take it quickly. Um, the first one is: uh, Can you please give some examples on how machine learning with experiments can help resolve global challenges like pandemics, wars, etc.? I, I do think the the pandemic is a really is a really good example of one where like we, we lack causal evidence because we you know we don't have a good centralized experimentation system <laughs> to to tell us like what the efficacy of certain things are. So I guess like masking would be a good example where like if we could have had some people randomly wear masks early on <laughs> and and learn that they were like you know less susceptible to contracting COVID, then you know that could have been knowledge that was de deployed more rapidly, very quickly. You know, there's lots of causal questions that come up in epidemiology that I think like are amenable to experiments. These experiments are also challenging. Things like vaccines and treatments have lots of ethical challenges, but I, I do think causal knowledge about what works to prevent disease and prevent symptoms of disease and things like that is a is a 
is a really great use case. And, and the, you know, pooling that information in a privacy sensitive way across many different countries and policies and dealing with the heterogeneity would be like a really, you know, dream scenario to build something like that someday. And I think it, it, it leverages a lot of the same ideas that I discussed. Um, Marianne says, uh, we know diversity and inclusion is challenging in AI. What strategies do you use? Um, I, I'm going to assume you mean um, like in the in the in the people that I that we work with and making sure that they feel included and that we're hiring and retaining diverse talent. I mean, it's a huge pillar for for Lyft and the way that we think about um, you know talent and diversity within the company. Um, I mean, we have to accept the axiom that diversity is good and that we like it and that it makes, it makes our company better and makes us a better place to work and that inclusion is important because, uh, you know, it makes people happier, but also makes us more, more successful. Um, probably the biggest thing I have learned in the last year is to be more empathetic about people. Uh, I've, I've had a lot of, I've, I've been really trying to hire diverse candidates for my team. And the hardest part is actually getting people to interview in the first place. And I've started to be... Uh, you know, have a much more hands-on attitude toward convincing, you know, un underrepresented groups to come in, like actually interview, because I've, I've had some, some candidates that didn't think that they could pass interviews or thought that the interview process would be too challenging or stressful for them. So, you know, building some empathy about what it's like and how hard it is to get a job at a, at a good company and making sure that that hurdle isn't, isn't present has been like my main new thing that I've learned. Um, on, on my team, I think mainly the, the thing is to, I, uh, make people feel inclusive through giving them different op options and opportunities to participate in the team. So making sure that like if the people are better at written communication or if they're, you know, they don't like presentations or they don't like attention or they do like attention, you know, modifying my management style to make sure that they, they get what they need has been probably the other big tool. Um, Last quick question. Can you describe if and how you do Bayesian optimization to know where to go with next with experiments? Yes, yeah, so the response surface methodology that I described uh, is a really nice property, which is that uh, since it's producing posterior distribution over the response surface, you can use the same Thompson sampling idea that I described earlier. We take a draw from that distribution <laughs> um, and, and then you can like, you know, take the maximum over many draws and then those are the regions that you, that you want to oversample. And um, it was, that's basically like, you know, it, it will probably pick points that are points that you have not tested yet. And so it's basically telling you like, what's, what's the most promising configuration to do. You can do Bayesian optimization to do all kinds of neat stuff that is not like, I, I, I have friends that are working on product design Bayesian optimization. So like if you worked on um, designing a car, you can parameterize the car, like make it longer, shorter, bigger tires, shorter tires, and, and you can generate new cars procedurally that way. And if you fit a response surface that says like whether the customer likes it or whether it's going to sell or, or like run a simulation and see how fast it goes, then you can use that to provide feedback on like what kind of car would be the next car to design. So, so Bayesian optimization, very powerful and general methodology. And it, and it, and it just relies completely on the idea that um, your uncertainty about the response surface tells you, you know, where to go next. Thank you, Sean. Um, now it's the time is coming up. Um, yeah. Do you have any advice to the audience and us from your perspective, for example, your opinion on the challenge in front of data science right now, um, what is coming? Any thoughts? Yeah. After that, we want to wrap up the session. I mean, the most powerful tool that you can cultivate is, and it sounds really generic, is curiosity about problems. I think the technical stuff is all in service of solving some real world problems. So being interested in, in a problem and in a, in a setting and talking to people and learning about what they know about it, even if they're not technical, has been probably the most important tool in my career. All the technical stuff, you can sort it out over time. But if you have picked the wrong direction, working on the wrong problem, don't understand what people already know about it, then it doesn't matter how fancy your model is or how much data you have. So I, I think, you know, I, I call myself a student of problems. And I think that that's really the way that I think people should behave more. And student, students of technologies, like, sure, you need to know that stuff, but it's not on its own gonna, gonna solve anything. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Thanks um, everybody for, for all your time. Yeah, so thank again. We want to thank Sean. And I also, we want, also want to thank all the audience joining us today.
And again, thank you very much for your time. And uh, I'm we are very pleased to have you all today. Again, My I want to th thank Sean. And we are very looking forward to having you all next time. Again, thank you very much, Sean. Everyone, have a nice day or have a nice evening. Bye.